What's up, everybody? It's Monday. I'm Mover, uh, C.W. Lemoyne. If you're looking for a book for the month of April and your quarantine reading, check out the Spectre Series box set. That's the first four books of the Spectre Series for a dollar. Uh, it's military espionage, terrorism thrillers. A lot of people have liked it so far. If you do, please leave a review. It helps support the channel. Uh, today, based on popular requests, we're going to talk about something in the news from last week, which was the final report from the French pensioner, uh, as they have said, that was accidentally ejected from an incentive ride. So a uh, 64-year-old uh, French defense contractor was given a ride in a Rafale and inadvertently ejected. Um, honestly, people kept talking about it. I thought this was a new incident because for some reason, when I first heard about it a year ago, I thought that the guy actually passed away, but luckily he didn't. So now we've got the accident report and I'm going to go through it. Instead of going through the news articles, I'm going to actually use the actual source. So we'll go through some of the stuff, talk about some things that I think may have happened and uh, kind of break it down. So I uh, hope you guys enjoy it. Thanks for watching. Three, two, one, fight off. So what we have here is the final report from the, uh, I'm not even going to tr try to pronounce it, but it's the Bureau of Accidents, essentially, for the French Air Force. Uh, the incident was on the 20th of March of 2019, and there you see a nice picture of a Rafale. So basically what happens, a French defense contractor, 64 years old, not sure if he was retired or about to be retired, but his friends decided to surprise him with a backseat ride in a Rafale. And they didn't tell him about this because they wanted it to be a big surprise. So the day prior, they go out to dinner and it's all set up. And that next morning, they shuffle him off to the airport. And essentially, he has no idea until he shows up and they're like, hey, it's time to do your medical eval for your flight. And he's like, well, what? So now he's very nervous. So he does his medical eval, and the plan is for him to be a part of an operational flight. So operational being, um, in, at least in the U.S. Air Force, when you do an incentive ride, there are two types. You can do a, what's called a FAM ride, a familiarization ride, where we actually go out and do a mission, so they're part of the mission, or you can do an incentive flight, which is basically just 100% dedicated to that person. It, it, there is no mission. So they were doing an operational flight. Uh, he does the the... Uh, medical workups and the doctor says oh, you're limited to three G's for this mission so they call the pilot and the pilot you know says okay no problem he's three G's so we were gonna originally do uh, a three ship of some kind of air-to-air -air mission so I'm assuming it was you know ACM air combat maneuvering 2v1 something like that or intercepts and they decided we're only gonna do the first part of the mission and then after we do the first part which is relatively benign we'll split off and go do um, a tour of the countryside or something like that. We'll make it a, a relatively low key mission. They shuffle this guy through. He's very nervous. He didn't never, never he didn't necessarily want to ever do this. Uh, they put him through a, some abridged uh, ejection seat procedures, training, uh, life support training, etc. He sits in through part of the flight brief, and then in the Frenchest thing that I can think of, they go to lunch right before their flight. So they come back from lunch, they go on the flight, the takeoff is a three ship, 30 second interval takeoff, and the sequence of events is basically uh, number one uh, takes off, two takes off and trail, they're only cleared to 2,500 feet, and then three uh, lights the blower, uh, there's a little bit of talking back and forth, and then dead silence from the back seater. Uh, as the, the pilot basically squats the jet, he does four Gs for three seconds to 47 degrees nose high, and then as he gets through, I think 600 feet or so, he starts to unload the aircraft to a negative 1G uh, profile, which unloads. And in that process, the backseater ejects. And in the ejection sequence, the um, canopy fracture system engages because that's what the Rafale has. So it fractures the canopy, which splits it open. The seat fires in the back seat. 
and then the canopy fracture system in the front seat fractures but does not fire the front seat. So the front seater is now still in the aircraft with the ejection s s sequence having already commenced. He elects to declare an emergency, squawks 7700, dumps fuel for landing weight, comes back around, makes an emergency landing, and then at that point, because they're not really sure if the seat's gonna fire or not, he does an emergency ground egress and they quarantine the jet for 24 hours till they can verify that it's safe and that's the end. The pensioner during the ejection process loses his helmet, uh, he gets minor injuries and uh, he's taken to the hospital but he survived. So let's look at the report. I don't speak uh, French as well as I used to but we can kind of, I've done a lot of Google Translate and I think this is a little bit better than actually going through the uh, articles and stuff because they miss a whole lot. So uh, basically uh, they had their, their preparation brief. He goes through and gets his training and uh, you got to understand with a fam flight the training is a fire hose and the way we typically do it is they'll go with somebody who's dedicated egress training that that actually can teach it to pilots and teach it to incentive flyers because they are the most current on this stuff so basically they'll teach you you know the ejection seat how to you know don't, don't touch black and yellow handles unless you mean to how everything works but realize they're getting in a, a one hour brief or two hour brief in something that we get time and time again as pilots. So it's, it's, it's very uh, nerve wracking and that's something that they talk about in the, in the report here. You can see here what they show the ejection sequence. He's on takeoff, he's 1G, 1G, he starts this two to three G. So what I'm assuming happens is he takes off, picks the gear up and he's just trying to look cool, which is number rule number one of being a fighter pilot. Sucks the gear up, gets some speed and then easy, gets that 4G just to get the 47 degrees nose high. And then they were only cleared to 2,500 feet. So um, instead of rolling the aircraft, he elects to bunt. And so in doing so, he's got, uh, he's got three G's, um, 3.7 G's max, and then he starts to unload. And in that unload, what happens is the backseater is now going from, I don't know if he didn't know that they were cleared. I mean, there's a lot of things that can happen, right? You can be number three and not realize you're only cleared to 2,500 feet and be like, oh crap, you know, I thought we were cleared to 10,000 feet. That's why I did this big Hayaka climb. So he, he bunts over. Well, the backseater's not expecting it. So he's not strapped down, which I'll show you here in a second. He's not strapped down very well in the back. So he's going straight to the top of the canopy. And as he does, instinctively, not knowing what to touch and what not to touch, he grabs the only thing that's the closest thing next to him, which is that black and yellow handle, and pulls to try to bring himself back down, initiates the ejection sequence, and off he goes. He has no idea he's going. So it says here that the uh, event happened at 650 feet, which later on there's another one that says it's about 1,200 feet. So I'm not really sure um, what the difference is between the 650 and, and a thousand but either way it was fairly fairly low out so there's the uh you can see the rafale um like i said throws him out which kind of reminds me of uh the le chevalier right the sky or, or uh you guys call it sky knight so we'll use sky knights knights of the sky um where the back seat's gone but the, it fractured the top canopy so as the pilot there's a lot of noise going around going on out there talking about the pilot this is very standard stuff he's a 35 year old he's got 2,000 hours total time and 900 hours in the rafale so he's an experienced guy he's not new at this uh, the passenger is uh, 64 years old and it's his first time other than flying an airliner. So he's not familiar with all this stuff. And the weather was cab okay, so ceiling and visibility okay. So weather wasn't a factor or anything. They weren't trying to you know, stay below a cloud layer or anything like that. And here's where they found everything. So he had a GoPro, which they talk about here in a second, that they found. It wasn't on though, because I think that'd be some cool footage. The passenger, uh, his medical was that morning. So they basically, <laughs> Did, the, did everything the morning of, and typically, at least for us, uh, there's a checklist you have to go through to go ride in the back seat of a fighter. And uh, part of it is a medical clearance and everything has to be uh, done, you know, you have to sign off. And in order to, to go to the step desk, you have to have this checklist signed off. So uh, one of the things that'll come from this is they'll actually recommend uh, as a result that they do it prior so that they, they don't have the last minute thrash. Because what happens here is, they give him a 3G restriction, which I think is a little ridiculous. I mean, if you're going to put him in a fighter, don't give him a 3G restriction. I mean, they could not really, there's, 
there aren't many missions that are just 3Gs. I mean, yeah, we can do some straight and level stuff and maybe intercepts and all that stuff, but they really, if they're gonna put him in a fighter as, a, as an operational sortie, which they've emphasized a lot in this, they should not have done the 3G requirement. I mean, and what that does is it causes a last minute thrash to call a pilot and go, hey, look, you can only, you gotta flex your mission and all that stuff. They say it's non-causal, but anytime you look at this, it's the Swiss cheese model, right? You've always got compounding errors, and this is just one of them where it's one more thing that went wrong and changed things, and this guy's real nervous. So at the moment of ejection, he was 650 knots, or 650 feet, 280 knots. So he was in, he'd been in that 40, 47 degree climb, and then he pushed over. There's the picture. I love how the avion, the airplane keeps going, and there he is. They also point out the fact that his raft didn't inflate. So good for him. I mean, it should have. So he had a lot of life support problems here. If he'd have been over water, it kind of would have sucked. Okay, here's the numbers here. So the altitude, uh, this is a very short time frame. And then as he gets to 1300 feet, 280 knots, um, 36 degrees, and then uh, he's, he spikes the G and then unloads. And so we go from three and a half Gs in four, uh, four seconds or sorry, four Gs in three seconds to the 0.63 in one second. So it's basically a squat the jet, unload, oh crap, I'm about to miss an altitude, something like that, my opinion only. So they talk about the selector. Uh, the sequencer had two modes. It's basically a dual and solo mode, which is pretty much every fighter. And the Hornet has three modes, um, aft, norm, and uh, solo. I might be confusing with the F-16, but uh, the F-16 and the F-18 have the three modes. So basically, uh, if you're in a dual mode, you want to be in an aft initiate. So when you pull the handle, the backseater goes first. So it's not blasting the front. So he's not getting blasted by the front guy, so to speak. And uh, if you're solo, you just want one seat to go. So you can actually have where, you know, if you're in solo, then the backseat pulls the handle. That's the only one that goes. Front seat pulls the handle. That's the only one that goes. This has that, but they were in, I think they call it two or something like that. So it was working and functional. And when he pulled the handle, there was actually a failure in the detonation sequence that popped the canopy in the first one. So that, that canopy fracture system actually worked, but they didn't actually uh, eject there. I'll talk about this here in a second, but the way he had his straps, he actually, it wrapped around the handle, so it had enough force that when it pulled, that when the canopy opened, that he, um, he took it with him. So that actually ripped off the ejection seat handle. So what they found, as far as equipment goes, um, his, the handle got a wrap, wrapped around his, his gear, his G suit, they talk about, they really spend a lot of time talking about his equipment. So his helmet comes off, they're basically saying, hey, his chin strap wasn't done, okay. Uh, his mask wasn't sealed properly, they didn't fit it right, and his right G suit zipper wasn't zipped. And then they, they talk about the straps, he didn't tighten down uh, when he got in the aircraft. Basically, just he was not, he was not cinched real tight back there. Things were not going well. So there's his helmet. He didn't have his visor down, but I think the guy was wearing glasses, or maybe not, I don't know. Uh, but he didn't have uh, his either visor down, which is pretty cool. We don't have this feature in American helmets, but they have the ability to have two different visors, which I, I think is kind of badass. All right, here you can see the strap. So this is the biggest problem. His, I, honest to God, with it as loose as it was, this dude probably had a lot of pain in the crotchetal region when the opening shock. I mean, he may not notice, but I'm sure he was sore for a couple days because if you don't have your uh, crotch straps correctly cinched down, you can be in for a lot of pain when that opening shock happens and then that, they stress that. So it has to be fitted correctly. So there you can see there's a lot of slack uh, in these straps, and this is what keeps you in the harness. Uh, and then there's so much slack that when the handle is pulled, it actually gets caught up underneath such that when, when it separates from the seat, it actually pulls, um, it pulls the handle with it, which they take, they say it's, it's, um, takes quite a bit of force. They also talk about his GoPro. His GoPro was there. It doesn't, they don't think it was causal. Well, there he is right there. Yeah, he's wearing glasses. That's why his visor wasn't down. Uh, but yeah, they said the suction cup, it, the, the camera would separate it, but you know, they could tell that it, it didn't affect the ejection seat sequence. Everything worked except for this one part here. 
and uh, this was not plugged in all the way, it was not screwed in all the way, and it did not complete the sequence to the front seat. My theory though, my question, because they actually grounded the fleet for a little, little bit of time while they sorted this out. My question is, if he had pulled front seat initiate, would the seat have fired? So if they really needed to eject with this happening, would the front seater have gone if he had pulled his own handle? Would the system work like that? I would suspect yes, but I don't know. They obviously have to rule out certain theories. They said, well, was it medical? No, he was nervous, whatever. Did he G-lock or A-lock? Uh, so almost G-induced loss of consciousness or actual G-induced. They're saying not really. I mean, he only went to 3.7 and then negative one. That's not really enough G. Is it possible? Yes, but probably not what happened. The biggest thing here is he was nervous. So as he had his uh, watch on, his smartwatch on, it says his heart rate was between 136 and 142, and he stopped talking during takeoff, which is kind of a sign that he was starting to get overwhelmed. So um, the biggest thing is when they went from the positive G to the negative G, the dude pulled the handle to try to steady himself and jumped out, and that's what they think is causal for this. Then they go on and talk about uh, his seat. The other thing is the nature of the mission. He was a three ship, he was number three, um, but they were only supposed to climb up to 2,500. And they spend a lot of time talking about how this is a normal takeoff. Um, but it was a surprise effect because the dude, A, didn't know he was going flying, B, didn't know that the takeoff was gonna do that, there just wasn't enough brief. They're just, the, the, all the things, you know, they were trying to make this a surprise for this guy and it actually probably is what caused it. Do I agree with that? Well, I don't know about the takeoff thing. When, when you do a, an unrestricted climb or something like that, yeah, I mean, that definitely warrants 47 degrees nose high, but 47 degrees nose high to go to 2,500 feet with a fighter that's got that much power, you will easily blow through that altitude. So you can see if he ejected at 650 feet, that meant they squatted the jet, went almost vertical, and then started pushing over. Typically, we don't do that. I mean, if you're only going to 2,500 feet, a nice 15 to 20 degree climb rate is really all you need, especially because you don't want to uh, have any issues. You know, you don't, you don't want to under G because you can under G stores and stuff like that. Plus, negative Gs are just not comfortable. So, I don't know if he just didn't realize he had that altitude restriction or he just wanted to, you know, prove the point, squat the jet, and then had that planned out. Why he wouldn't roll, I don't know. But typically, you know, if I'm doing an unrestricted climb, I take off, get the gear up, get enough speed, squat the jet, go up and then roll at the top because it's much more comfortable to do positive G's and the guy doesn't uh, have, or whoever's in the back doesn't have a problem with it. So uh, on that note, I've done quite a few um, incentive rides and fan flies, especially in the F-16. That was the common profile, right? Uh, in the F-16, we would do the takeoff. We would, you know, get to 400, 450 knots, squat the jet. So, you know, you get to that 45, sometimes 60 degrees nose high, go straight up, roll it, and then you'd actually go down into a low level that was down in Homestead. Nine times out of 10, that's where the incentive flyer would get sick. That's the, the first maneuver you do and they're not used to it, they're not expecting it or whatever. The thing about incentive flights and fan flights is they cannot be rushed. And sometimes they do get rushed, but uh, I've had a lot of experience doing these uh, with my current squadron and previous squadrons, and especially in the current squadron because we don't do any incentive flights in my current squadron. We only do fam rides, so that's what this was. And the problem with fam rides versus an incentive flight is you go brief whatever mission you're gonna do, so you're busy thinking, okay, I'm gonna be red four, I'm gonna be red one, I'm, I'm gonna be doing something else. And then at the end of the brief, they go, hey, here's your backseater. And a lot of the stuff has already been done, you hope, and you have to brief them. And a lot of times when I go through the actual passenger briefing, I go, hey, um, how are you gonna emergency ground egress? And they kind of give me the you know, deer in the headlights, like what? And they, I know they've gotten the brief and I know they've been trained well, but the problem is, it's not like when I go fly, right? I'm used to it, I've done it before, I'm not nervous, I'm not anything. They are terrified sometimes. They have never done this before. They don't know what's gonna happen. So you have to slow down and you have to, because they've gotten that fire hose of information. So for them to be rushed in this situation, it is just an error chain that was very hard to break because this guy, number one, didn't even woke up that morning not even knowing he was gonna fly. And number two, he didn't get all the brief and stuff because they're behind, they're changing the mission, they're doing all this stuff, they're going to lunch, they're, they're, they're not getting, uh, paying enough attention to it because they're, it's complacency, complacency always plays a part in some of these things. So, 
Um, when I sit down and do the briefing guide, I'm like, okay, well, if I do this, we're going to do this. You can expect this. Here's what the mission we're going to do. Now, obviously, if it's classified, I'm not going to tell him classified stuff, but here's what we're going to do and here's what you can expect because no one told him, apparently, that they were going to do a quick climb, squat the jet, and roll, or and not roll, and just push over so he'd feel light in his seat. The second part of that is from the moment you as the pilot walk through life support or the PR shop or whatever you call it and whatever service it is, you know, they, the PR shop or the life support kind of failed him here too because his gear didn't fit, his straps weren't right, um, his mask didn't fit correctly. They didn't help him ensure success, but I don't think that's causal. I just think, well, that they just pointed out the fact that it was kind of crappy. Because um, they talk about the G-suit zipper, who cares? If you're only pulling three Gs, the G-suit zippers don't matter. Uh, so he goes out to the airplane, and typically when I go out with an incentive flyer, I will, the crew chief will help them into the jet initially, because I've got stuff to do, right? I've got to check the forms, and I've got to do my walk around. I will come back around, and then I double check. I know the crew chief's better than I am at strapping the incentive flyer in. I mean, I know that. They are, they've done it more than I have. They're more experienced at it. But that doesn't mean I still don't go in and check every single strap and every harness and go, hey, is this cinched down? Is this plugged in? Show me how you're going to use the oxygen regulator. And the reason for that is maybe 15 years ago, 20 years ago, I don't know how long it was, but an F-16 at Key West had an incentive flight in, um, uh, it was a crew chief or I think um, some maintainer in the back seat of an F-16. He did not know how to use the oxygen regulator and it was off and he had his mask up and he couldn't get his mask off and he suffocated in the back seat and died. So uh, it's very important that they know how to use this stuff. And that's kind of the stuff that you, you get. You know, this pilot was experienced. He knew it probably wasn't his first time. So you have to go back and you have to check everything because they're nervous. You know, it's not like throwing the flight dock in the back seat because they're they've done it before. It's somebody who's brand new to aviation, especially this guy. He's never even been in a fighter. So they had to, to check everything and they probably would have, you know, found, hey, your chin strap's not done. Your mask doesn't work right. Um, you know, they, they, the straps at least would have been done. Now, it's very hard to see when you're sitting down, but if there's that much slack, like they pointed out, yeah, absolutely would have found that. The other thing is when you're actually doing it, you got to talk. And unfortunately, you know, fighter pilots, we love being quiet, and that's why most of us don't want to have a whistle in the back because we just want silence. But when you're with an incentive flyer, you have to go, okay, you ready? Okay, you got this. You know, you have to talk through. And I like to, you know, when I fly with somebody, I like to talk through what we're doing so that they understand um, what's going on. There are times, and I feel bad for the cadets, we'll be doing something and the mission will take priority where I can't stop. I tell them that. I'm like, look, if you're throwing up back there, I got to fight this Raptor. I can't stop, I cannot stop what I'm doing. You're just gonna have to suck it up and we'll figure it out when you're done. But most of the time I can still talk through and just go, okay, we got one more, one more leaf, one more set, we're gonna pull, we're going left, we're going right, okay, you're ready. Um, that might have helped here too. The biggest thing is, dude, don't don't put, do a negative G. I mean, they keep saying this is normal, it's not. I don't know a single fighter pilot that likes to pull negative one G. That's no, I wouldn't do that. Um, now, on incentive flights, it's different because on the incentive flight profile, we used to go out, I we would explain it to them in depth and in detail and go, okay, here's what we're going to do. Then, you know, if you don't like it, please let me know. We'll do something else. If you don't like this, we don't, you know, operationally, you don't have those options, but for an incentive flight, you do. So, um, and this is not the first time. This incident reminds me a lot of a Tomcat incident where uh, a SWO, so a surface warfare officer, got an incentive ride in the back seat of an F-14 and they were going out and doing a mission. So it wasn't, I'm sorry, it was a fam ride and they were doing the GX and he usually did uh, inverted check uh, just to make sure, you know, everything, the loose items and stuff. So he does the G warm and then when he rolls inverted, the backseater is not expecting it, you know, because he's, and it's, it's his fam ride, he doesn't know. And he just reaches down to grab the first thing he can and he pulls the handle and he goes. So, a lot of this could have been mitigated through having more time to brief him, to having more time. So, you know, being rushed probably was a big factor um, in that. They talk about his helmet going. I mean, that really didn't matter. I mean, unless you're going to hit your noggin on something, that helmet, I mean, it's not that big of a deal. 
Uh, and then the visor down, yeah, that sucks for wind blast and stuff, but the guy apparently made it. I don't know what his injuries were, but it sounds like he's back to normal. And I'm very happy that he survived and he did well, uh, other than, you know, ejecting and they didn't, and they saved the airplane. So that's the other thing is had the sequencing system actually worked, the front seater would have been punched out and had no idea. He just would have had no clue whatsoever and just would have, you know, been gone. And all of a sudden, I don't know what happened. I don't know why. Wow. I mean, I can't imagine you're on climb out you push over and all of a sudden you're out. I mean, geez, what do you think of that? And then who knows where the jet would have gone. So I guess they're lucky in this case that it, it didn't work out. Anyway, just my opinion. Here's the report. I'll leave a link in the description if you're French and understand French, or if you're like me and you can put it in Google Translate, uh, you can go read through uh, everything that happened. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this. I hope, uh, hope that uh, answers some questions. Uh, you know, if I do any more French stuff I mean, between this and Sky Fighters, I may have to start uh, stripping off a of Corsair. Don't Manchester me. Uh, you don't want to see that. Uh, anyway, I hope you guys enjoy it. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Excuse me. Oh, no. Oh! oh a lot of that. Usually fly with the doors off. All hot Don't be a douche. Rule number one. I can tell you now.